Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to the beginning of a new video series. It's going to be on a topic that I have probably had more viewer requests for than any other topic I can recall. I'm going to try to uh, cover the basics of oscilloscope usage and how you can use the oscilloscope uh, to diagnose problems in tube amplifier circuits. Now this is a massive topic. It would take many videos to cover all of the applications of this device. Uh, but I don't really think you need all that. Uh, what I'm going to cover is my own basic knowledge of the instrument. Uh, and you can carry it further if you wish. But I think when we get through you're going to have a pretty good understanding of how the oscilloscope works and how you can use it in a constructive manner to diagnose problems with your uh, tube amp circuits. In preparing for this video I watched a bunch of other videos on YouTube uh, that uh, were dedicated to the basics of oscilloscope usage and I've got to tell you in most cases I got confused watching them. Uh, they talked way too fast and they covered way too much information they jumped around and the one thing that really bugged me is they would just start flipping switches and to get the desired image on the screen without really uh, explaining to you what they were doing. Uh, so I'm going to try to avoid those pitfalls. I'm going to go very slowly and methodically through this and try to explain everything to you. And we're going to try to move in an incremental pattern where we start with the utter basics and build on that. So if that sounds like something that uh, will work for you, then please stay tuned and uh, let's get started. Now hopefully you all watched uh, the preceding video in which I discussed isolation transformers uh, and their use with oscilloscopes. I have not yet received the parts that I've ordered uh, to build my own isolation transformer. Uh, they should be here this week and I will prepare a video uh, of the process by which I build this uh, isolation transformer and then once I have mine and hopefully you have yours we'll be able to proceed on using our oscilloscope uh, to do some uh, troubleshooting and signal checking in uh, amplifier circuits. Until then, until we have our isolation transformer, I'm just going to stick with the oscilloscope and the signal generator and uh, we'll see if we can't learn how to operate the controls so that we'll be ready to do some troubleshooting uh, on an actual amp circuit. Also, in the isolation transformer video, I discussed the probes that we'll be using uh, with our oscilloscope. Uh, we have the little hook to hook onto wires in the uh, chassis under study. We have the uh, possibly hazardous ground connection uh, that we uh, know that we need an isolation transformer for the device that we're testing so that the hazard is removed from this. And also, we have the mysterious times 1 and times 10 switch that was discussed in that video. At, with the times 1 position of the switch, we have a 1 meg ohm resistor in series with the signal that's going to be coming in from our uh, electronic device that we're evaluating before it can go into the innards of the oscilloscope. Now, 1 meg ohm is going to give you quite a bit of protection against a sudden onrush of current or extremely high voltage coming in here to damage uh, your scope. Uh, now, the thing is with this, uh, it gives you greater flexibility because, say I want to hook onto something that's 400 volts. Uh, at times one, then, I would have to have a, a vertical axis here that could show 400 volts. Now I can click in values for each of these squares, but I cannot click in enough value per square to show 400 volts on the screen. Therefore, before I hook onto that, I'm going to switch this down to times 10 to cut the 400 volts down to 40 volts, which I then can see on the screen and uh, will be a manageable deflection of the sine wave uh, 
or uh, whatever type of uh, image that I have on my scope. So this gives you great flexibility as far as the voltage readings that you connect to. One thing you have to remember though is if you go to times 10, remember that the image on the screen is one-tenth as tall as it should be. The times 1, you will get the valid height. Now the oscilloscope probes are connected to the input jack here with a BNC connector. Uh, they're going to push on and then this rotates to lock them in place. The outer surface here, the perimeter is going to be the shield and inside is the little hot pin that is going to bring the signal from our uh, circuit under test into our oscilloscope uh, to be uh, manipulated by the electronics within. Uh, now let's get to the mysterious screw that many of you have been wondering about. This would be a good time for you to attach either one of your probes if you have a single channel uh, oscilloscope or both of your probes if you have a two channel oscilloscope using the BNC connectors get them connected and put the little mysterious screw at the top of both of your uh, probe connections. With that done, let's push the on off button and turn on the oscilloscope and let it to start to warm up. Now that the scope is on uh, and is warmed up, hopefully you're going to see a horizontal line across the screen. If you don't see it, don't worry. Uh, we're, I'll show you how to find it, okay, and how to put it there. Now let's learn these four controls here, one, two, three, four, uh, as they will help us uh, get this line where we want it and make it appropriate for our viewing. Number one, let's go over here to the position control with arrows up and down. Just as it implies, this will help us position that horizontal line. I'm going to position it right on the dotted lines which represent the x-axis of my screen. Intensity is exactly what you're used to seeing. You can make that line just as intense as you want. I would back off and make it where I could see it clearly but nothing excessive. Let's drop down here to the focus knob and sure enough, just like it says, it can be really a fuzzy line or it can be a super sharp, clear line, which is exactly what I want it to be. Now, what if you don't see the line right now? Well, let's say it's up at the top. Watch this. I'm going to push something called beam find. Isn't that what we're, wanted, what we're trying to do is find the darn beam? Push it. Look at that. It brings it down from up above. It says, hey, I'm up here. So then I know that I use my position control to bring it down. Now, what if it was off the bottom of the scope? Is the oscilloscope working now? I'm not sure. Let's push beam find. Oh, no, I'm down here. Here I am. So we'll bring it up from the bottom. Okay, so now we have changed the position of the beam. We found it with beam find if it's uh, not showing. We have focused it into a sharp line and we have uh, altered the intensity to where it's just fine for us to see but not excessive or damaging to the phosphors of this scope screen. Okay, now what if no matter how much you try to focus you still get like three blurry lines or you've got something that's jumping all over the place and it won't hold still. Well, I'm going to direct your attention over here to the top right corner of, of at least of my scope to something called trigger. Now, I will explain this in more detail later, but for now, try adjusting the trigger until that line... See, I went too far I'm going to adjust it and watch. When I get trigger set just right, look at rock solid straight line. It's not jumping around. If your line is jumping or it's uh, three lines or four lines, move the trigger knob for now without knowing exactly what you're doing. Just move it 
until the line settles down. One other possibility, if you can't see the line even now, you might look over here at the trigger section and move the slide switch that says mode just move it over to TV line you'll have no idea why or, or what this is actually doing but if you move over to TV line your line may uh, magically appear on the scope now it's time to start using our probes and we're going to start off with the probe notice it has the red line there and the red line there I want the probe for channel one okay and what I'm gonna do is come over here and if you look you should have a little uh, kind of a little stud that comes out the front of the amp and it'll say probe adjust now set your uh, slide switch to times one and hook the little uh, hook at the end of your probe to that probe adjust stud that is protruding from the front it may be a loop or like a horseshoe in my case it's a like a little nail head hook your probe onto it and if you have another connection for ground I have it here but it requires uh, a jack to slide in so what I'm going to do with my ground is if you've got a little ground loop hook your ground uh, alligator clip onto it if you don't just hook it onto the exposed piece here of this BNC connector now we have made uh, a, a closed circuit with our oscilloscope. Okay, we have the probe for channel one connected right down here uh, to the probe adjust stud and it is receiving from a circuit within the oscilloscope a square wave which we're going to use uh, to calibrate our probes. That signal is coming down here and is coming in right here into the oscilloscope. Now to get the image properly on the screen we're going to have to make some adjustments. Okay right here where it says AC ground or DC go to AC uh, because square waves are alternating current. We're going to tell the oscilloscope it's going to see a form of AC. Over here uh, it says mode. Now mode is one of those terms that can be a little confusing uh, but it really doesn't matter when you think about the, what each of these switches says. This one says, do you want to see channel 1 on the screen? Do you want to see both of them at one time? Or do you want to see channel 2? Well, since I only have the probe connected here in channel 1, let's set this over to channel 1. That's what I want to see. Over here, do you want to see channel 2 upside down or right side up? Well, uh, I don't really care because I'm not looking at channel 2 yet but uh, when I do it may be important but for now I'm just going to leave it in the norm position and then over here we've got add alt and chop now God only knows what those mean huh? so for now let's just leave it in the alt position and we'll discuss this at a later time so a real quick review we've got our probe down here at our uh, probe adjust uh, stud We've got the uh, AC setting here. We've got channel 1, norm, and alt. Now you look at the scope. And I've got this. You No telling what you've got on your scope. But let's set an adjustment to where we all have exactly the same thing on our scope. Okay, I came over here and I removed my probe from the probe adjust to look at what the heck this is putting out and it says 500 millivolts okay peak to peak well 500 millivolts is a fancy way of saying what a half a volt okay so that's what is being put out from my probe adjust let me put my probe back on that lug and look over here how can I reconcile that half a volt with what I see here. Well, that's where this knob, which is probably one of the two or three most important controls on the whole oscilloscope, comes into play. Remember our little probe was at 1x? Let's try putting 0.5 remember it's 500 millivolts is going out uh, from our probe into the scope 
uh, thanks to our little that little stud down there that I'm connected to. Let's put 0.5 volts over here where the 1x probe setting is. And lo and behold, how tall, what is the amplitude of our square wave? Now notice, this is a square wave. Okay, that's a whole lot easier to work with because it's flat on the top and flat on the bottom. So we're going to use it for this purpose. Okay, the uh, output from our probe adjust is a square wave. So we're looking at it here. And how many squares tall is our waveform? If you say exactly one square, you win the prize. The reason it's one square high is no coincidence. We just adjusted this knob so that each vertical square has a voltage value of 0.5 volts. So we have an output signal of exactly 0.5 volts. We set the scope to give us one square deflection on the screen, one square, for every 0.5 volts. And that's why our waveform is exactly one square tall. Looking at that, then looking over at the knob setting, you would instantly know that, yes, I have a square wave coming in here. I don't know the frequency yet, but that's going to be something we're going to learn also. I don't know the frequency, but I know the amplitude, and I know that it is exactly one half volt from here to here. Now, if it made sense to you that setting the channel 1 uh, deflection to 0.5 volts per square with this knob and then inputting into our oscilloscope a 0.5 volt um, square wave and we see this on the screen and sure enough one square of deflection vertically is exactly 0.5 volts just as I set it. Now if that makes sense to you that's it, okay? All the rest of this is just going to um, be cake, I guess, because that's the way oscilloscopes work. What we have mastered then is the vertical deflection that is set by this knob. We know that it relates to the voltage that's contained within the waveform. So now we know about our y-axis deflection controlled by this knob. Let's go over to the second channel and see what we have. By now, I hope you're thinking, well, let's see, this button right here said uh, channel 1 or channel 2. So I'm going to flip over to channel 2 and notice that channel 2 has its own position knob. So I'm going to run that down. Now, I don't see a square wave. Uh, okay, I see a very, very intense line but I don't see really a square wave. Can anybody tell me why I don't see a square wave over here in this channel? For those of you who said, well, because I'm only putting my signal into channel 1. This is my channel 2 probe. I'm going to have to hook it up. You're right. Let's do it. Now I'm going to take my yellow, yellow test probe and hook it up down there to the uh, probe adjust lug to receive a 0.5 volt square wave. Okay, I'm all hooked up. Uh, this doesn't look like the other one did. So what do you think? Do you think maybe it has something to do with this knob setting here? Which on my scope right now is at like 20 to 50 something. I mean that doesn't... I thought it was supposed to be 0.5. Let's click this around to where 0.5 shows up, just like it did here, and look what we have. Isn't that mysterious? We have exactly the same square wave with exactly the same one square vertical deflection that I set with my channel 2 voltage knob. Okay? Isn't that... It, that's kind of nice, isn't it? And we can move it up and down. We can move it all over the place. It has its very own position setting. Okay, so I'm going to set it right there where the base is on the x-axis. 
Okay, and it's still exactly one square of deflection because I told it to deflect one square when you see 0.5 volts and then I fed in 0.5 volts down here and it did exactly what I asked it to. Now the last knob that we're going to master in this video is going to be the little scrawny knob that's in the middle of both of these knobs and it says cal and it has an arrow. Now I'm wondering what that's all about. Okay so I think since the number two channel and probe are the only ones that are receiving a signal and they're the ones I'm watching on the scope according to this slide switch that says you're just watching uh, channel two. Uh, let's turn it and see what happens. Well look at that. You see the deflection change? What this is is a way to calibrate the screen response to the knob setting if it isn't exactly perfect. This is like a fine tune, okay? And I don't really think we're going to need it, but I just wanted you, I wanted you to know what the meaning was of that little knob, okay? And to be honest with you, I never mess with it. Okay, now for the icing on the cake, let's try to figure out what that little screw does, okay? So there's going to be several steps that we have to go through before we can figure that out. Number one, reach down on your probe, the yellow one in my case, and switch it to times 10. Okay? Now look what happened to my uh, square wave. It collapsed. It's there. It's just flat because now it's one-tenth as tall as it should be. So let's crank in a little bit lower voltage for it. I'm going to crank my uh, channel 2 volt uh, knob from 0.5 where I had it all the way over to about 20 millivolts. And look what I have. A really nice looking square wave. So as you can see when the minute I clicked in the times 10 on the probe, I had to compensate by changing the voltage deflection. By putting in times 10, my square wave collapsed, and then I had to give it a, a more and more sensitive deflection value to get it back up to this height. Okay, so you see the interaction and why you have to be careful with your slide switch settings on these probes. Right now it's at times 10. Okay, this is what I have. Now you may not have this. You may have something that looks like this. Like the raggediest square wave anybody ever saw. Well, if that's what you have, put a tiny little screwdriver down in and crank that tiny screw and calibrate your probe so that it has linear response for times 1 and times 10. That means you'll get the same waveform if it's at times 10 as you did at times 1. Now granted at times 10 it'll be shorter because it's one tenth as tall but it will be the same shape. Well that was so much fun let's try it with the red probe from channel 1. I've hooked my red probe up over here to the little 0.5 volt square wave output and I've hooked my uh, ground lead right here to the BNC shield and I don't see anything here. Does anybody have any ideas? Oh, wait a minute. How about this? Remember, if you want to see channel 1 on the screen, you've got to show it channel 1. Okay, now that looks a little intense to me, so I'm going to back off of the intensity. And once again, it maybe it's collapsed. Let's crank channel 1 over here. Oh, look what we're seeing. And when I get to 20 millivolts, look what I have. Looks very similar to what the uh, channel 2 probe produced, isn't it? But what if your square wave looked like that? Well, as I recall from channel 2, I turn this little screw here until that top is flat 
and it's just as square as Abe Lincoln's hat. Okay, so now I have calibrated this probe so that the response then is linear uh, between X1 and X10. Both of my probes are now calibrated. When I was a school teacher, kids used to love it when I'd give them extra credit questions. So I'm going to give you one now and see if you can figure it out. I've got the scope set up here uh, in the way that we're used to seeing it. We're on channel 1. We have 0.5 volts uh, per 1 square deflection, uh, which means that if the amplitude of the wave rises 1 square, then that is an equivalent to 0.5 volts, which you know is 500 millivolts. However, when I shift to times 10, my scope image becomes one-tenth as high. Now it is, if I home in here, actually two separate lines, one-tenth as high as they were when I was at X1. So here is your question. What can I set this knob to? where the square wave at X10 will look exactly like the square wave at X1. I mean the same height, everything the same. Think about it. Where can I set this to make that happen? If you wish, why don't you stop the video so you can have a little time to think about it. Okay, here we go. Now there's several ways to approach this problem. If the output of the square wave generator is 0.5 volts, and that output is diminished to one-tenth by switching the probe from X1 to X10, then the uh, modified output is going to be 0.05 volts. This is the same as 50 thousandths of a volt. Uh, one thousandth of a volt we know as a millivolt, so this is the same as 50 millivolts. This conversion is necessary because it's the way the oscilloscope is calibrated. Well, let's see if it works. 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. There it is. Exactly the same square wave. So by altering this setting to one-tenth, we now exactly match a voltage output that was diminished to one-tenth. So one-tenth the voltage, one-tenth the setting, you get exactly the same uh, screen plot. Now I'm not sure if some of you noticed, but there is a shortcut. Instead of calculating one-tenth of the uh, original 0 0.5 volts, we can simply use this indicator over here when we shift it to a 10x probe to get the voltage per uh, vertical uh, square deflection value. Okay, so you can divide by 10 and use this as your indicator or not do any division and simply use the 10x probe indicator to dial in your 0.5 volt value. If you got it right, then congratulations, you're well on your way to the Scope Hall of Fame. Okay, that's about it then for this session. I think it best that we break it up a little bit so that you can thoroughly digest the information that's been presented. I want to take a few seconds here to thank some viewers for some very generous gifts. Uh, first will be from Jim. I got this set of 10 uh, dial plates which will really spruce up uh, my homemade amps. And second to Randy for sending me such an incredible gift that it's going to be the subject of its own video series in the near future. I also want to thank all of those viewers who have made Patreon pledges and PayPal contributions. It's your generosity that keeps this channel on the air and free of advertising. Should anyone uh, else out there in the audience want to join in and help, uh, I've included links in the video description. Thank you. Okay, I think that's about it uh, for this part one video. Uh, I'm hoping you're really anxious for part two to keep on learning. What I recommend to you for homework is that you go in here and mess up the knobs, the ones that we've learned about, okay? Uh, go ahead and change them all around so that everything's screwed up on the scope. Um, then 
come back and systematically locate where is my scan, bring it to the center, get it focused, get it um, a proper intensity, set your different voltage deflections for it. Uh, you can use this as your signal generator right here for now until you get your own. In part two, we'll probably start using the signal generator and you guys that don't have them are going to be at a, at a loss because we're going to go into sine waves and we're going to be able to generate all sorts of different waveforms to study. But if this part made sense to you, the uh, y-axis of voltage deflection uh, set by these two knobs in our two channels, then the rest of it I don't think is going to be challenging. Okay, so practice, study, try to uh, get where you're good at it. It's like playing tennis. And uh, I'll see you again in part two. Here's that little Track T roadster idling. I guess he's warming it up before he hits the road. So nice. Great sound, huh? I just couldn't resist spending a little more time with this 409 engine in the five window coupe. Look at this craftsmanship. And attention to detail. It's about ten times harder than it looks. Really something. Okay, that five window coupe with the 409 is getting ready to leave. I thought you might get a kick out of this end of this thing. Call out a baritone exhaust. What a beast. And I mean the car, not the girl. How about this for a nice old 55 Chevy? two-door post. Look at that. Straight as an arrow with... I'm not a fan of fender skirts, but some people love them, and there they are. That's the trunk the original old-fashioned license plates. All in all, a nice car. Got a little wave on the side there, but who doesn't? Overall, a nice presentable car. Here goes the 32 Roadster. I asked the guy in the little Model T truck, he said it was built in Canada and it does have a Pinto four-cylinder, which is about all the engine you could fit under that tiny hood. Um, he just got it. 